You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation, old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to vanupodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. Welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm your host, Shane. This podcast is covered by BIPCOT's No Government License. This allows reuse and modification to anyone, except for governments and the agents thereof. You can learn more by visiting BIPCOT.org. So today's podcast is number 55, another in our Crypto Anarchism series. It is titled Gun Printing 101 with Ivan the Troll. We'll be getting back to the basics. So we'll define our terms, discuss types of printers, uh, Polymer and CAD software, some miscellaneous topics, and then we'll move on to your questions. Uh, so, Ivan, welcome back to the Vani Podcast. Uh, how are you doing today? Thank you. I'm doing pretty good. Good to hear. Good to hear. So, if you don't know who Ivan is, please please refer to our first discussion. Uh, I'll put a link to it in the uh, show notes, but it's number 54 of the podcast, the uh, last episode. Uh, so, I've, Ivan, uh, anyway, real briefly, for, for any new listeners, can you provide like a 30-second overview of uh, who you are and uh, what you do? Yeah, I'm Ivan the Troll. I'm a member of Deterrence Dispensed, a group made in the image of Defense Distributed, but entirely decentralized, so much so that we don't even know one another's names. Uh, I've sort of been unofficially elected the group's spokesperson, although I never asked for such a role. I kind of enjoy such a role because I enjoy talking. Okay, very good, very good. So uh, to to start, Ivan, um, uh, I guess we yeah we and I, I mentioned in pre-show uh, that on this podcast we've always started with definitions. So um, that's what we're going to going to do today. So um, we'll start with uh, the uh, uh, what's a three uh, D printed gun, Ivan? How would that be defined? Right. So there's been a lot of discussion about this, even in, in like gun culture itself, in our own little 3D printer gun sphere. There's been lots of discussion about like what constitutes a 3D printed gun. So I haven't really voiced this much, but I, in my mind, I sort of categorize it one of three ways. So there's primarily printed guns, and those are going to be like your Liberator, your Songbird, your Wash Bear, where there's maybe one or two metal parts, like a firing pin or a barrel liner, but everything else is going to be polymer printed. Uh, so uh, th those guns, of course, have their drawbacks. I think to date, they're almost all single shot, those uh, primarily printed guns. And so, I mean, as a result, of the limitations of plastic are going to make it so if you have a barrel where the entire barrel is plastic, so it's not a composite barrel, it's just a plastic barrel, you're going to be limited to a small number of shots. The Songbird can do 20, 20, 20 or more. I, I've, I've heard as high as 50 on some uh, Songbird barrels and 22 long rifle. The Liberator can do maybe 10 at the most and 380. So, the, so there's a couple primarily printed guns, but they're probably the least common type of design. And I mean, uh, probably also the least viable as far as like an extremely effective firearm, because most, most if not all, are single shot. Mm -hmm. So the second tier then, as I sort of touched on there, is a composite firearm. So what I mean by that is, it's like, it's a matrimony of plastic and metal parts. So examples of this would be like Derwood's AP9, our upcoming FG C9. Uh, there's a couple other designs out there, but in general, the gist of it is, you use hardware store parts in conjunction with printed parts and your end product then is a firearm that would work as well as like an off the shelf or gun store firearm, but you didn't use, you know, like it's not entirely printed, but it's not entirely metal. So there, there's no like strict definition in my mind for a composite firearm. It's just a gun where whenever you look at it, you see that most of the parts are printed. So the AP9 is a good example where the upper is printed and the lower is printed and the buffer tube is printed. And you can see it's got a steel barrel put, you know, sticking out the front. And you can see that it's got an AR-15 off-the-shelf fire control group in there. But otherwise, you know, it strikes you more as that's a printed gun than not, simply because lots of the big parts are printed. Mm -hmm. And so the finer, final echelon in this three-tier thing is uh, a, a printed component. 
So in the United States, um, firearms are regulated in a way that only one part is deemed the firearm. So an, an AR-15 is the lower receiver. The ATFs, like the, the, their rule that they try to stick to is it's whichever component accepts the fire control group part. So that's the trigger and the hammer or your striker, your striker setup. That's the definition they claim to stick to, but there's exceptions to that. Like on the FNFAL, or the FAL, in the FAL pattern rifles with the MBELs and the AL1A1s, it's the upper on those that is regulated and not the lower. So even though the lower on those has the trigger and the hammer, you know, the, it has all the trigger components, they regulate the upper instead. The HK, G3, MP5, all of those stamped uh, roller delayed guns that uh, HK made are all the same way. Where the, you know, the, the, the grip section on them, which has the trigger, all the trigger components is not regulated. It's the stamped upper that is. So the ATF doesn't always stick to that strict definition, but in general, there's only well, I think I don't think there's any examples of there being more than one regulated component on a single gun. So the you know the ATF says the lower receiver is regulated on an AR-15. It's the gun, and no other part is the gun. So it's by by legal definition then, if you print that lower receiver, you can say it's a printed gun because that's the only part there that constitutes a firearm in the eyes of United States law. Mm, okay. So it is a little bit it's a it's a little bit of a misunderstanding and like a misnomer because somebody will say, look at my printed AR-15 and all they've done is print the lower. But by legal definition, it is a printed AR-15. And I don't really take any objection to someone saying their printed AR-15 lower is a printed lower. And this goes on. And the, the, I'll try and keep my tangents lower on this show. But this goes down a tangent, you know, because our group was discussing this at length. But the tangent we went down is, you know, people call Glocks polymer pistols or polymer framed pistols. But in general, like they're referred to as plastic handguns and, you know, in gun nomenclature. And we all realize the Glock has a steel upper and it's got a steel barrel and it's got steel uh, fire control components. And it's not like an entirely plastic gun, as you would think if you hear polymer pistol. Mm -hmm. uh, in the early, early days of the uh, M16, like my grandpa still refers to ARs as plastic guns simply because they had plastic furniture everywhere. And that was like, you know, that was had shock value back in the 60s whenever the M16 was first, uh, you know, the, the M16 was new. People referred to it as a plastic gun and thought it would be weak and it would break easily because it's covered in plastic because they're just coming out of the era of Bakelite when plastic is incredibly fragile stuff. Mm -hmm. But for that reason, the AR-15 was referred to as a plastic gun. And then later in history, like throughout the 80s and 90s, as well as some in the 60s, 70s, you see the AR-15 referred to as an aluminum gun. While we understand that the bolt and the bolt carrier and the barrel, many other components are still made of steel, people still called it an aluminum gun simply because there were components of the gun that were aluminum, and that was not, you know, that, that was novel then. Not every gun was made of, in fact, very few guns mm. were made of aluminum parts. An aluminum receiver, that was like a get out of town sort of thing back in the 60s and 70s. So it was referred to as an aluminum gun. So now in the 21st century, whenever we say we have a 3D printed AR-15, for the same reason, I don't see a problem with calling it a 3D printed AR-15 because you've taken a part that is traditionally made not in a 3D printed way and you've 3D printed it. So if you call it a 3D printed AR-15, as long as whenever, because no matter what, the trolls show up and try and say, well, you didn't print the entire thing. But so long as you're like, no, I didn't, but by legal definition, it's a printed lower. And this is a novel thing that I have here, right? It's not, I'm not trying to say the entire gun's printed. What I'm saying is, I've printed a critical component of the gun, which is legally the entire gun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very interesting, very interesting. So um, I suppose the, uh, the the next the next thing we should get to is uh, the types of printers. Now we talked about this a little bit in, in our first discussion. Um, they're kind of uh, different uh, different stages. Obviously, you can spend as much as if uh, you're willing to pay 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 uh, an amount of money for something. Uh, someone someone will be willing to uh, to supply that. So. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess let's let's go ahead and get to the types of printers. Uh, let's uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Uh, walk us through the various types of printers. Okay, so last time we had talked about the metal printers, and I'll touch on them again briefly this time. Although I won't go into how they work because if you're really that interested, you can go to the other show. We're essentially just going to leave metal printers. That there's two way that two ways that metal is done. It's done using a direct uh, laser centering process or it's done using a centering process, like a post-process centering. And both of them are really cost prohibitive at this point, although that may change in the future. But again, go to the other podcast for more information on that. 
so when it comes to consumer friendly stuff there's really two main kinds of printers that you're going to run into with a third one that's going to become affordable within f under five years so the most common one the one that everyone is used to is like the fdm which is fused deposition um, of material printer it's also sometimes called fused deposition modeling printer it's also sometimes called fused filament fabrication printer again like we had talked about in the other podcast each kind of printer has like four different names attached to it and they all mean the same exact thing but fdm the way that works it works in a nutshell is picture a hot glue gun right it's got a hot nozzle and you squeeze the trigger and it squirts that glue out of the hot nozzle because the nozzle will melt it so now picture if you took that hot glue gun you set up a robot to pull the trigger at very precise levels and you know so very precise levels increments and rates and then you set up a robot arm to move that hot glue gun in very specific patterns and now imagine that, that that robot now understands that it can print one layer by moving this hot glue gun around and leaving a very specific path of hot glue then it can move up a layer and then do that again that's exactly what a fdm printer is it's a glorified computer controlled hot glue gun uh. it works essentially the same way except it's got a computer controlling it so uh, there's, there's like those like five minute hacks or whatever that were popular. I think they might still be popular on YouTube. I haven't been on YouTube like looking on YouTube in a long time. But you know, so there are people who are using hot glue guns as like three like manual 3D printers. So they would like build a shape up out of a hot glue gun. So if you're familiar with what that is, this is just a computer doing that for you. Is what an FDM printer is. They're the most common kinds of printer uh, by far and away, and they're the most cheap kind of printer by far and away. Uh, the, the, the printed gun community, like the new folks that were getting into it, were standardizing them on the Crea Creality Ender 3, which is a Chinese-made printer. And don't let the Chinese-made scare you away, because they're made quite well. Uh, the, you know, the experience that these new people have had with them is quite positive. I think we had a guy that within one week of getting his printer had printed a usable, one of the, print, the Glock, printable Glock 17 frames. He had printed himself one of these frames within a week of setting up his printer, which is just awesome. Right. But in general, that's the, you know, the FDM printer. If you're interested in getting into it, it's a Creality Ender 3. You can probably just search Ender 3 on Amazon. Uh, they're $200. They'll go on sale for $180 with free shipping sometimes on Amazon within the U.S., but oh, pretty wow, much that's worldwide, cheap. they're sold for... Hmm? That cheap. Okay. Yeah, yeah 200, 200 bucks, pretty much anywhere in the world. So a, a step above that in FDM printers would probably be the Prusa series. Foscad still recommends the Prusas over the Enders. And I, I mean, depending on what your budget is, I would agree. I would go with a Prusa over a Ender. Uh, Prusas are sitting at, I think, 800 bucks now. When I bought mine, they were 650. And they've gone up in price, but they've also gone up in the features they have. So I'll stop here and we'll, we'll get to the other kinds of printers in one second but what i'd like to stop and talk about is the features and advantages between the creality and the prusa because i constantly get asked <clears throat> i constantly get asked this question i think it's very relevant so whenever you get the ender it's the bare minimum a printer should be at least in my opinion it's got a heated bed it's got a good a good structural setup so it's, it's got uh, metal uh, it's got a metal frame basically what I'm trying to get at. So it's like the bare minimum you would want in a printer with no extra frills. There's printers that are priced between the Ender 3 and the Prusa that, you know, so, so you know, they offer you one feature or the other. The Prusa essentially offers you all the nice features in a cheap FDM printer that you would like. The Ender offers you essentially none of them, but the Ender is upgradable to some extent. So the main differences between it is the Prusa offers you a quick detachable bed. The new Mark III does, I believe. It, co it comes standard now with a detachable bed, which is super cool because it makes it easier to get your prints off the bed. The new Prusa comes, well, all Prusas come with automatic bed leveling. So one of the hardest things with the Ender is you have to make the bed perfectly square to the nozzle. And if you don't, your prints will end up looking wonky. The Prusa does that for you, which is quite nice. So you don't ever have to worry about that. Once you've learned how to level a bed, it's not a problem on the enders. It's, it, it'll become something that you don't even really have to think about. But if you want to cut out that part of the learning, the Prusa takes that part of the learning. You don't even have to worry about it. The Prusa also comes with a hot end that isn't a plastic on heat sink, or sorry, a plastic on heater block hot end. So 
without getting too deep into it, the 3D printers use a Teflon tube to guide the filament down to the hot glue gun, the hot part. If that Teflon, on printers like the Ender, they come with a stock hot end where that Teflon tube touches the heater block, which is the hot part. As, as some of you may know, right around 250 Celsius, Teflon starts to release a gas that's, that'll make you sick and it'll make you queasy and sleepy and all sorts of not good stuff and it'll kill pet birds if you've got pet birds. So the realities are like they're, they're, they're software limited. They won't go above like 245. They might be able to go 250, but I think 245 Celsius is the hottest they will let themselves go. So the Perusa uses what's known as a heat break. So the Teflon tube does not touch the heater block directly. Because of this, the Perusas can get up to 300 Celsius and not even be fine, but they're software limited 300. So getting above 300 requires all sorts of different changes. In general, 300 is the hottest you're going to get from an affordable printer. I think in order to get above 300, you're now looking at like a two, two to three thousand dollar printer. But so so between the two, the, the, like probably the weakest thing then on the Ender is that hot end because you're limited to 240 Celsius, 245 Celsius, which means there's some high strength nylons the Perusa can do that the Ender can't. Now you can upgrade the Ender with a micro a micro Swiss hot end. There's tutorials all over YouTube about how exactly you install that upgraded hot end. So whenever the Ender is running that hot end, it does have the same temperature range it can print as the Prusa. Um, I guess one other notable difference is that the Prusa comes with a nice uh, glass bed, whereas the Ender comes with like a, a crackle finish bed. A lot of people just, uh, swear by the Ender 3 stock bed not working. I've never printed on a stock bed Ender 3, so I wouldn't know. I've all I've printed on a buddy's, and it's a he's got a glass bed for it. So an upgrade, another upgrade that the Ender could use is a glass bed, and those aren't terribly expensive at all. But much aside from those two differences, I guess the Prusa has more build volume. Something you always need to be aware of is a printer has a limited space that it can print in, known as its build volume. The Prusa has a little bit bigger build volume. That said, you can print uh, AR lowers, you can print block frames, you can print uh, Glock magazines on both. So it's not like the Ender's running out of room for certain projects. Mm, but okay. if you wanted to print, but you know, there may eventually be a time where the Ender 3 just isn't enough. I don't know that we've reached that point yet on any printable project, but at least so people are aware, the Prusa does offer a little bit more print area. So that about covers FDM printers. So the other kind of printer that's out there in the consumer market is known as SLA. So what SLA is, it's not, I can't explain it as eloquently as it's a hot glue gun with a computer. What SLA is, is pictured you've got like a vat and that vat is full of a liquid that whenever you shine a light on it in a particular spot, that liquid gets hard. So that's essentially how an SLA printer works. It's got this vat of UV hardenable, UV curable resin in it. And then it's got a UV laser at the top of the printer. So it fires that UV laser down in that specific pattern that it wants to harden. And then it increases the, le well, some of them increase the, the level of the fluid. Some of them lower down the bed that it was already printing on. But you know, either way, the effect is the same. So you, you zap your resin and you harden it. And then the, the layer of the liquid is now, you, you increase it. So the layer of the liquid, the resin is now a, one layer above where it is that you just hardened and then you harden the next layer. So you just use the layer laser to harden layer after layer one on top of the other. SLA printers are generally more expensive than FDM printers. SLA printers almost always don't have as big a build volume and SLA printers are generally not as strong either. So FDM printers, you can print some really, really strong nylons on. Uh, SLA printers are kind of lacking as far as the strength goes. The big advantage to SLA is if you're interested in using your 3D printed parts to make, uh, like for, for 3D printed assisted casting, SLA printers can print with very nice surface resolution. So whenever you run your finger along the side of the part, it won't feel like it's 3D printed. It'll feel like it's just like a normal part. Whereas on FDM printers, essentially always you can feel the fact that it was printed because there's, you know, there's layer lines that you can run your finger along. And you can see those layer lines in pictures, of course. Right. So I think as far as affordable SLA printers go, I know Prusa has a new one that I think is 1300 bucks, but I'm pretty sure you can't fit an AR lower in it, so it doesn't even have my attention. You know, maybe maybe one day they'll make a bigger one and I'll be forced to buy it just to print an AR lower on it to say I've done that. 
<laughs> so the last thing that I wanted, well, two, two more things to touch on here on the subject of printers. The first one being that printer that I mentioned, the new technology that's coming. So Formlabs has a printer that works like this. So in, in industry, like selective laser centering of nylon. So the same way that I talked about last podcast, there's the, the, the printers that can zap a metal powder with a laser and then fuse it together. That same kind of printer can be used to print nylon parts that way. And Formlabs has a machine, and I think it's called the SLS-1. And I think the, I think they ask like $3,000 to $5,000 for it, which is pretty cost prohibitive. And it might be more than that because I might be confusing it with another printer. But the Formlabs SLS-1 does this process of, you know, to lay down a, a sheet of powdered nylon and then a laser in the top of the machine will fuse the nylon in the correct layer, but then the rest of the nylon remains unfused. So once you're done, you brush off all this powdered nylon that worked as support material, and now you've got your, your centered part this way. And the surface finish on that is generally incredible, as well as you get excellent layer adhesion, because you weren't melting it out of some kind of hot glue gun, you were really fusing it with a layer, a laser. So it ends up producing a little bit stronger parts that way. I think at this point that those printers only work with nylon, those form labs ones, but nylon is an incredibly powerful material, as well as nylon is one of those things where there's nylons that are hard and flexible, or there's nylons that are hard and brittle, there's nylons that are soft and flexible, there's nylons in between. Nylon, nylon is a very wide range of things. So that's something to keep an eye on. If those SLS nylon printers get a little bit cheaper here in a couple of years, I would start recommending those over FDM just because there's less issues that you'll run into with uh, S, uh, the SLS printers, the laser centering ones. Mm -hmm. And so the last thing to mention while we're on the topic of printers is, uh, well, I'll save this for later. Tell you what, I'll save it for later. Okay. All right. Very good. Very good. Uh, definitely, definitely interesting. $200. Uh, I didn't realize it was that cheap. I'm gonna, I might have to hop on this too. Um, <laughs> just just start messing around with it. But uh, anyway, I guess the next uh, the next uh, point of discussion here would be the types of polymers. Um, obviously, there's uh, I think there's PLA, ABS, nylon, PETG. Uh, there might be might even be some other ones. Um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the various types of polymers. Sure. So as you mentioned, there those four are probably the big ones. If you're you know, so you get an FDM printer, I would say those four are probably going to be your mainstays. So I'll just run down the list there. I'll give uh, just some relevant properties, tips and tricks, uh, printer settings that I like to use for each of them. So for PLA and PLA plus also falls under this category. PLA plus is controversially stronger than normal PLA. Some people think it is, some people think it isn't. Some tests show it is, some tests show it isn't. I like PLA plus just because it comes in nice colors. The co you know, it comes out kind of shiny, so it has a nice surface finish on it when it's done as well as the fact that I think PLA plus prints easier than PLA. But I should also explain, PLA prints easier than any filament out there. PLA was specifically formulated to be able to print really, really nice. So it prints at a rel relatively mild temperatures. So I like to print it at 235 on the hot end and then 60 on the bed. Mm -hmm. So it's normally recommended you print it at 205 on the hot end. I find that if you print it hotter, the part will end up coming off the bed much stronger. And that printing PLA plus or normal PLA at 235 doesn't cause any, so normally the hotter you print, the worse the surface finish is, like the more ugly the part is. I haven't had any problems printing at 235. So I recommend 235 on the hot end, 60 on the bed for printing PLA. As far as tips and tricks go, uh, using glue stick can help some, like if the corners of your prints want to warp up, because you know something you need to consider with FDM printing is you're printing this plastic at 230 Celsius and it very quickly cools to room temperature. As it's cooling, as I'm sure everyone remembers from like high school or even before that uh, science class, things that are hot expand and that are cold contract. So once this plastic starts to cool, it tries to contract. So there's constantly this like a uh, this uh, contraction force coming towards the middle of the part. And so because of that, I'm sure there's people who have been printing like the AR lowers and you have the corners of the lower start to warp off the print bed. And if you have it warp enough, it ruins your print because now the entire mm. part will try and warp up. And if it gets really bad, the entire part will warp to the point where the whole thing pops off the bed, which is really unfortunate. So some ways to uh, combat that with PLA. Normally PLA doesn't warp much, but if you print at high infill and a part like an AR lower, 
where it's really long and doesn't have a lot of surface area, it will try and warp with PLA. But uh, you, you can use glue sticks, like cheap Elmer's glue stick, slather on a thick layer on the print bed where it is that you set your part up to print, and go ahead and print on top of that glue stick. You can remove the glue stick later using acetone or using salt water. And, and it won't damage your bed at all to use a glue stick, of course. And glue stick is like non-toxic and safe because kids eat it or whatever. But <laughs> you can, using, PLA, using PLA on glue stick is a good option for keeping those prints stuck down a little bit better. And that about covers my tips and tricks for PLA. Really, there aren't a lot of tips and tricks. It's very easy to print with. Very nice stuff. And how much, so uh, how much does PLA eat, run um, price-wise? Uh, like, like $20 a kilogram, which is cheap. Okay. Okay. Very good. Yeah, very, fairly cheap. So you can you can be printing off AR lowers. Well, I I don't recommend you print AR lowers and PLA as like a last resort. You can, but I should mention I should mention properties of each of them. So PLA is very stiff, but it's very brittle, and this is because whenever PLA gets hot and then cools, it crystallizes. So if you, you can think about glass, but of course it's not as exaggerated as it is for glass, because like glass is incredibly hard but incredibly brittle. PLA is, of course, less hard and less brittle than glass. But the same way that glass is like it is where it doesn't want to break, you could push really hard on a glass window, but before it budges at all, it just shatters. PLA is a lot like that. So PLA has a little bit of flexibility to it, but before it flexes too far, it just wants to break. It'll shatter. And that's because it has an internal crystalline structure, sort of like glass does, sort of like diamonds do. And so because of that, it has almost no flexibility to it. It has almost no yield. It just instantly goes to breaking, which means that as, as far as its fatigue properties go, like it's, you know, cycle after cycle after cycle, it's really bad. And if you look at an AR lower right at the buffer tower, all that those forces that it's going to see there, are like it's cyclic. What that is, is it's, it's a fatigue, it's a, it's a fatigue force is going crazy there. Hmm. So as your gun recoils and it recoils and it recoils, it puts a fatigue force on your buffer tower because it's you know, cycle after cycle. With PLA, you're going to have to hope that the, you know, the recoil forces aren't enough to def deflect your buffer tower at all. And generally speaking, they are. If you use a 22 long rifle upper, of course it's not gonna happen, but in 223 or anything bigger, including nine millimeter, because nine millimeter is direct blowback in AR uppers. So it has significantly, it has recoil forces on par with 223. So because of that, for essentially anything besides 22 long rifle and an upper, uh, PLA is not a great idea for your lower because those fatigue forces will eventually get it to shatter. Okay, interesting. So the, the, the solution there is to use a material that's got a little bit more flex to it as well as a little bit more strength overall to it. And that material is ABS. ABS is the same thing that Lego bricks are made out of, which is super cool. And ABS has a lot of neat properties to it that uh, oftentimes don't get taken advantage of. So I'm going to first address the problems with ABS because there are problems with ABS. The first problem is uh, it's supposed to cause cancer. The fumes from like hot ABS are supposed to cause cancer. And that's not like a known to the state of California to cause cancer. It's like a research papers have come out saying, yeah, it might actually definitely cause cancer. I don't know that I'm like super concerned about it, but it is something that you guys should probably take note of. I print in like a small room that smells like ABS 24 seven. So I've probably got my lethal dose by now anyway, if it is as mm. bad as they say, but it could also just be like, you know, for a while they were saying hot dogs were like guaranteed to give you cancer, but then they backtracked that saying maybe not. So I don't know. So it might be one of those things that it might, might end up just being a known to the state of California to cause cancer, but it might actually be a risk. So if you do print in PLA, you should exercise good judgment and do it in a ventilated area, not in a small room, or you can just do whatever you want. Don't let me tell you what to do, but it might cause cancer, so be aware of that. Also, the fumes just smell bad. It's not pleasant. Uh, the other problem with ABS is, so I'd mentioned PLA warps a little bit. ABS warps a lot. So ABS, as it cools, shrinks significantly, and because of that, it will really, really want to warp off a print bed. So there's a couple solutions to this, like the industry standard solution, and I shouldn't say industry, the hobby standard solution is to put an enclosure over your printer. So what an enclosure is, it can be something as simple as like a PVC frame that you like throw trash bags on top of, but you're trying to trap a little bit of heat around the printer. So that way the printer is printing in a warm environment. And so whenever you do that, 
the AVS won't be able to shrink as quickly. So it'll shrink more gradually. And because of that, it won't warp off the print bed. So AVS is still, of course, shrinking because that's what AVS does. But it won't grab your part and warp it off the print bed while it's shrinking because it'll shrink slower. So that's the idea behind an enclosure. Now, a solution that I have found and I exercise because I don't want to have to build an enclosure. I've been incredibly lazy about building an enclosure, in <laughs> fact. The solution I use is a technique that's known as ABS glue. So some places sell ABS glue. I wouldn't buy ABS glue from anyone because it's very easy to make on your own. So the interesting property of ABS I had mentioned at the beginning of this, ABS dissolves in acetone. So that may mean, okay, cool, I can stick my Lego bricks in acetone and then they turn into a liquid. But that means a couple things for 3D printing. The first being, you can take some of your scrap ABS, dissolve it in acetone till it's completely liquid, then pour that mixture on your print bed, sort of like a thick layer. Use like a straight edge, or I use like a popsicle stick. And if you tap the popsicle stick, you know, going left to right and then right to left across the print bed, you can get a nice level layer, layer of ABS. And whenever that acetone evaporates off, you'll be left with a layer of ABS across your print bed. If you print your ABS part on top of that layer of, uh, of ABS that you've uh, applied using the acetone, your print will have a very hard time warping off. It will not want to warp off. The problem with this becomes your part will stick to the print bed so well, you'll have to like get creative and use chisels and take a whole lot of time in order to get your part off the print bed because it will really, really, really stick down if you use a thick layer of ABS glue. But the upside there is it didn't warp off. So the other, the other use then for ABS is uh, dissolving in acetone is if you have two parts made of ABS and you paint acetone on one part and you paint acetone on the other part and then you stick the two acetone surfaces together, you can weld ABS parts together that way. So that becomes incredibly abusable to the point where you can print you can print two parts separate, paint them with ABS, stick them together, and then stick them in a clamp and let the acetone dry. And when you come back, it will be fused together like it's one part. It also means that you can polish ABS that way. So if you, you can stick a, like a five gallon bucket over the top of like an open bottle of acetone and your, you know, your printed part, and then come back and check in 30 minutes, and your part will be shiny all over the surface. Like the layer lines will start to disappear because acetone will evaporate into the atmosphere underneath your bucket and it'll settle on your printed part and then smooth the layers on your printed part. And that has the bonus of it increases strength of the part. It increases, the, you know, it makes it shiny and smooth on the outside, as well as you can then use it to weld parts together. So ABS is very, very cool for those reasons. As far as print settings on ABS goes, I usually print it at 265, although you can print it as low as 250 and it works fine. I haven't really noticed a difference print in strength printing 250 versus 265. And for bed temperature, do 100 Celsius. I think that about covers ABS. Uh, what about the uh, the price for ABS? So I think uh, PLA was $20 uh, a kilogram. So there's a couple grades of ABS. You can use Chinese ABS. So, so for, for PLA, I recommend like Esun or Hatchbox PLA. You can use the cheap Chinese brands of PLA. It works fine. For ABS, I recommend the more expensive brands of ABS just because I think it works a little bit less. That said, you can use the Chinese ABS. It says at about $20, $25 a kilogram. The more expensive American stuff, the company that I use is called IC3D. There's rumors that go around that say that their ABS is just like respooled Chinese stuff that they're selling for more expensive. I don't buy it because it warps less and I think it ends up stronger. But you know, maybe that's true and I've just been fooled. But my, my tests and analysis would suggest that I have not been fooled and that IC3D is a little bit better. It runs like 45 a kilogram. So it's essentially double the price, but I would say it's worth it. If you're, if you're new to printing ABS, learn on the Chinese stuff, because if you can print the Chinese stuff, you can print any ABS. Okay. All right. Very good, very good. And uh, I guess the next one would be uh, nylon. Right. So with nylon, uh, there, there's, there's a lot of confusion out there about it. So in the early days of printing nylon on FDM, it was very difficult because the chemists that were making these batches of nylon for 3D printing were just taking like normal blends of nylon and then making it into a filament form. So the problem with it is nylon doesn't really like to stick to stuff. And so people were having a really hard time getting nylon to stick to a print bed. It would want to warp off. 
and nylon shrinks probably more than ABS does as far as like it's a, a shrink shrinkage rate as it's cooling. So people had a lot of trouble printing in nylon for, for a little bit there. So there's a lot of this uh, essentially FUD out there about uh, you know, nylon's hard to print. With modern nylons, uh, for example, uh, DuPont's Zytel high strength nylon, I don't think it's possible to have problems printing it. It prints so nice and so easy and so smooth. There's a couple other uh, Tallman, nylon, Tallman grade nylons out there that I have had reported to me also print really, really nice. Uh, nylons are in general stronger than ABS, more flexible than ABS, and have the added benefit of modern ones work a lot less than ABS. As far as tips and techniques go, uh, glue stick works with ABS, or sorry, glue stick works with nylon. Glue stick does not work with ABS, but glue stick works with nylon as far as getting it to stick down to the bed some, because like sharp corners, like on AR lowers, will still warp up with nylon. But if you use a little bit of a glue stick, that'll be avoided. Uh, as far as like getting really, really strong parts, nylon is generally the way to go. There's a uh, DuPont now sells a fiberglass impregnated nylon. So there, it's their Zytel, but impregnated with uh, fiberglass. It's the nicest printing filament I've ever used to the point oh, wow. where I've printed AR lowers. I've printed AR lowers, literally zero work. Incredibly strong filament. Uh, it, it ends up being as strong as selective laser centered nylon, which is kind of hard to believe, but it, it, it does it does do incredibly well. And I have a couple, I think several, several lowers now printed in it. And it's very, very strong stuff, makes excellent lowers, makes excellent Glock frames as well. So I, I give I, I give my recommendation to both of those DuPont plastics. Uh, the problem with them is they're expensive. I think it's like $100 for normal Zytel a, a kilogram and then 110 for the fiberglass stuff. Wow, okay. So it's yeah, off, awfully expensive. As well as uh, stock uh, Enders, stock Ender 3s cannot print the fiberglass stuff. And to print the fiberglass stuff at all, you need a hardened steel nozzle because fiberglass is abrasive, of course. But uh, stock Enders can't get hot enough to print the fiberglass stuff. Really, you want to print both the normal Zytel and the fiberglass Zytel, Zytel at like 280 Celsius, which of course the Ender can't do, but you can print the stock Zytel, non-fiberglass Zytel, you can print at 240. It's just that the layers won't be very well fused at 240. Mm. So in general, if you want to print Zytel, you need the upgraded hot end for the Ender, or the Prusa is entirely capable of it. I print all my Zytel on a Prusa. So there are other grades of nylon. So I, I consider Zytel like high strength nylon. It's kind of how I describe it. That's how DuPont sells it, describes it. There's other like mid tier grades of nylon. So there's like not, all sorts of known in the industry as nylon six or nylon six six. Uh, so there's like all sorts of Tallman grades that start with a six. There's a couple uh, nylons that start with a nine, like nylon nine ten. The problem with nylon becomes, like I was talking about earlier, that nylon means a lot of different things and there isn't just one nylon. But in general, nylons are great for printing AR lowers. They're great for printing Glock frames. It's fairly easy stuff to print with once you figure it out. Glue stick works well with it, but print settings are gonna vary based on the grade of nylon you have. In general, you wanna print it hot. In general, your printed bed's gonna wanna be hot. But you know, the, again, the nylon's like a, a great big mixed bag. There's lots of it, and most, but most everything that's sold nowadays is like optimized for 3D printing. So Dupont's Zytel uh, filament is optimized specifically for 3D printing. That's probably the reason why it doesn't warp much at all, is because they specifically made it not to warp. Okay, so so I have a question. Uh, how many? So how many uh, like lowers, uh, uh, AR lowers, could you print with a um, hundred dollars worth, one kilogram of that nylon stuff? How many lowers could you print? Um, I want to say you're guaranteed five whole ones, but oh wow, so, as, depending on because it, it always depends on how you set up your supports, and then, you know, how, if you fail any prints as well. So I think I've got five. AR lowers and a Glock frame out of a current roll of fiberglass I'm printing on, or the fiberglass uh, Zytel. So I, I want to say that you can do maybe six AR lowers off it. But again, it depends. And I should have talked about this earlier, but there's a thing known as infill in 3D printing. 
and what that is is like you you because because you have a 3d printer you have control over geometry so you don't have to print your part solid if you don't want it you could print it so it's 10 percent hollow on the inside all the way up to 90 percent hollow on the inside uh, my the first ar lower i got to print that worked well i printed at 30 percent infill which means it's 70 percent air on the inside and abs and i've got 2,000 rounds through that lower and i ended up decommissioning the lower just because the buffer tower was starting to get like floppy loose and i'm sure it was only a matter of time till it broke and i didn't want to see it break so i just said that it did 2,000 rounds and i decommissioned it and that was like my trophy because it's you know it's my first so i can't i can't break it right but it, so so you know we know now that the 30 percent infill in ar printed ar lower with abs will start to die around 2,000 rounds which is still ridiculous because that thing is 70% hollow, which is hard to think about. But you get full control over you know, the internal fill whenever you're 3D printing something. And as a result, you could probably get like eight AR lowers out of, this, uh, out of one roll of fiberglass. I'm printing everything solid, so I think six would be around the maximum. And again, it depends on how you set up your support, and if you fail any prints and that sort of thing. Right, right. Okay, that's not bad at all for a hundred dollars worth of uh, material. Not bad at all. Um, and the lowers are quite strong. Gotcha. Very good. That's 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 positive to hear. Um, so I guess uh, I think the last one we have to talk about is uh, Pet G, right? Yep. And so I threw Pet G on this list just for my buddy in Carbonite. He loves Pet G. He prints lots and lots in Pet G. Pet G is like sold as. It's the strength of ABS, but it's as easy to print as PLA. I think, I agree with the as strong as ABS. It definitely is. I have had more trouble printing PLA, or sorry, PETG than printing ABS. I can't get PETG prints to stop warping. I can't get PETG prints to not be hideously ugly whenever I'm done printing them. That being said, I've maybe printed like one roll of PETG before I gave up but I just have the darndest time printing with it. In general, I mean, I can give you, I, well, I shouldn't I shouldn't recommend temperatures or specs for PETG simply because I have terrible results with it. So use whatever the manufacturer recommends. They know better than I do in this case. But uh, pet, uh, the advantage of PETG is it's very chemically stable, so no chemicals will break it down. It's like a kind of got a glossy finish. There's transparent uh, P or pet G's, which is cool because you know transparent. Unless you make, when I say transparent, don't think it's like looking through a glass window. It's like you could like maybe shine a light through it and you can see a light on the other side, but it's cloudy. It's like cloudy glass. Mm -hmm. That's what it looks like. Um, really, that's just about all I have to say about pet G. It's an option, and if you can get it to print right, you can get quite strong prints. Like in Carbonite, has all sorts of stuff. You done in PETG. He's done the Glock frames in PETG. He's done AR lowers in PETG. But I just have the darndest time working with it. And I know some other people are in my same boat where we just can't, we, we can't get it to run right. But then there's people like in Carbonite who can you know, do amazing things with it. But I feel like it's worth mentioning just because uh, some people find that it's like a less warpy ABS. Hmm. Okay. And it sits price-wise around $20 a kilogram as well. And uh, it runs on, it, you can print it easily on a Creality editor. Okay. All right. All right. Very good. Yeah, I, that's 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 positive to hear. Um, so I guess with a couple hundred dollar printer and maybe an upgrade on that printer, um, and then you could you could have uh, really nice nylon lowers then. Um, yeah, that's that's right. that's positive to hear. Um, so I guess the next thing and would be... All, oh yeah, go ahead. Through, through all my testing on that, those fiberglass nylon lowers, I've been putting a lot of time into that recently. So through all my testing on them, I found that you cannot make one that's really like invincible, which is kind of a bummer because I really felt like I could for a while there. So you can't make one that's like indestructible to the point where you'd have to really, really want to break it in order to break it. But you can make ones that are essentially like neg like negligence proof. So you, you can make one where you could lean on your rifle, like if you stuck the butt of the rifle on the ground and leaned on the barrel, that wouldn't be a problem for it. You can make ones where, like, if you dropped your rifle, if you threw your rifle on the ground, if you, like, just you grabbed your rifle by the barrel and slung it as far as you wanted to, you can make ones that that wouldn't break. You can't make a nylon, a printed nylon lower, where if you grab the barrel and if you grab the stock and then try to do a push up on that, that wouldn't break it. Pretty consistently through the the nylon lowers I've printed, they break like that. 
There's one where when trying to do a push up, I barely managed to move myself up an inch and then it broke. And that was on one I, you might have seen on my Twitter feed. I've been using fiberglass and fiberglass resin to reinforce lowers on the buffer tower. And even still with the reinforced buffer tower, it gave out after I maybe pushed myself up an inch. Okay. So you can't make one that'll pass the push-up test, but you can make ones then that are, you know, they're resistant to abuse, which is great. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Very good. So I guess the next the next topic would be uh, CAD uh, and like uh, the software side of things. Now, um, when I downloaded the Liberator Pistol a few years back, a handful of years back now, um, basically, um, I downloaded because I wanted to look at it, right? Like I, didn't, I, I wasn't going to do anything with it, but I at least wanted to open the file. So I, I Googled it and uh, popped up, uh, you know, STL Viewer let me view these CAD files, right, where they were. Um, so I downloaded STL Viewer and was able to look at them and I didn't print anything with it, but that's the only, uh, that's the only software I'm, I'm familiar with in this realm. Um, so uh, what are, what are the, uh, you know, what's, uh, what software is out there? What's the, uh, the best and I guess uh, most user-friendly to use? So generally speaking, the best CAD software that's out there is, well, at least at least for like beginners and introductory people, and the one that the we're trying to get like the new people to like standardize on is Fusion 360. So Fusion 360 is made by AutoCAD, and it's like a partially cloud-based, which I know is like a turnoff for some people because they don't want any of their stuff in the cloud. But I mean, we, we did all, most of the AR15. Uh, CAD assembly work. Jacob was doing all of it in Fusion. I did just a little bit of it in Fusion. Now, Fusion 360 is very powerful. It's free. You get you, you can get get it free claiming you're a student. So you claim you're a student and you can download it with a student license. Essentially, you just check a box that says I'm not going to make more than ten thousand dollars off of using this. And if you do make more than ten thousand dollars a year off of using it, then Autodesk can sue you, and that's what you're agreeing to. There is, I'm a student, and I'm not making money off of this. Mm -hmm. Or you, you promise you're not using it for your business. So, of course, you can get a free version that way. Uh, the free version, I believe, for Fusion offered you all of the tools, which is cool. So you can you can do everything in it. Uh, like it's a full 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 CAD studio for free, which is awesome. So I do recommend Fusion just for that. It's pretty darn easy to learn. There's lots of tutorials out there for Fusion. Because Fusion has been free using the student method for quite a long time, lots and lots of people who've made tutorials. Um, I won't go like too deep into like how it is you do things in Fusion, simply because if you're interested, download it. Start on a tutorial. You can just Google or YouTube like Fusion 360 tutorial, and you should be able to pick it up pretty quick. I think like people tend to like scare one another about CAD being hard. And I think a lot of that has to do with like, uh, again, I'm going to make fun of boomers, but like boomers who learn to draw on 2D drawing boards hate CAD simply because it's different. <laughs> Meanwhile, I think like anyone, anyone who grew up in like the, the internet or video game era is going to think CAD's not that bad simply because like you're used to using a computer, right? Gr right? Grandpa grew up using pencils on a drawing board. That was normal to him. Like he, he wrote in cursive. That was normal to him. Just like <laughs> we grew up on computers, that's normal to us. So CAD isn't as bad as people make it out to be. So there, there, that's one kind of software that's involved in the whole 3D printed gun stuff is, like that's known as a CAD studio or a CAD environment or, yeah, so CAD software. The other kind of important software to know about is slicing software. So what slicing software is in a nutshell is, is it takes your CAD model and converts it into instructions for your 3D printer. Because your 3D printer is really dumb. Like I talked about FDM machines, or like a computer controlling a hot glue gun. It really does think very, very on a very stupid level. It's, I'm going to move the X axis this far. I'm going to move the Y axis this far. It doesn't know what it's making. It's just reading a list of instructions to say, move this axis this far, move this axis this far. Mm -hmm. so because of that, uh, you know, you, your CAD model has to be converted to move this axis this far, move this axis this far, and then that's one layer, then move this axis this far for the next layer. So your slicer is what does that. Your slicers are slicing software. There's a couple free slicing softwares out there. I believe Cura is free. I haven't used Cura much at all, simply because uh, Prusa has their own a slicer, which is known as SLI Slice, but then the E is replaced by a 3R, so it's like Slice 3R, Slice, Slice, yeah, Slice 3R. 
and that's done specifically by Perusa, although you can use their uh, slicer, slice freer slicer for other printers. Uh, Perusa makes it in-house. I think it's got good features and I think it's incredibly easy to use. But in general, the way your slicer works is you import your STL or your OBJ model file. And then in your slicer, you choose what material you want to print it in, what settings you want, what kind of supports you want, how hot you want to print it, where exactly on the print bed you want it, or, you know, where, to, where you want to print it at on the print bed, what orientation you want the part in. Your slicer is where you have full control over that. I think for people who are new to stuff, worry more about learning how to use your slicer than you do about worrying how to use CAD, simply because you can be great at using CAD, but you're not going to be able to print much off if you don't know how to use your slicer. Mm, so get yeah. familiar with the slicer. Again, all sorts of tutorials out there for a slicer. And using a slicer is easier to learn than using CAD. Because r really, the hard part about using a slicer is understanding what each term means. So like what you know, wall, you know, like number of walls or wall thickness or what a raft is. All, all these things you'll pick up on pretty quickly. And of course, I mean, load up a roll of PLA on your printer mess around you sort of just draw a cube in CAD or download a cube STL and just mess around in your slicer with all the different settings and then print this cube like a hundred times load up a roll of PLA just do a whole roll of PLA spend a day printing cubes and looking at cubes and seeing how the different settings in your slicer affect what it is that you're making and once you've mastered that I mean you're, you're by then you're essentially halfway to being great at this because you figured out your slicer the other thing you have to figure out is CAD and then you're an unstoppable ghost gun maker at that point because you can draw <laughs> your own CAD and you can print your own parts. Right on, right on. So, so real quick, uh, Ivan, I think uh, um, for the show notes of this episode, um, if you could, um, obviously we can do, we'll do, the, we'll do this afterwards. But um, like for the types of printers, like one or two that you recommend, types of polymer, um, what you recommend, what you've had success with for CAD software, obviously Fusion, then um, whatever slicer you recommend, uh, etc. I think it'd be worthwhile to put that in the show notes. Uh, so we can just make it, people can just go to the show notes down, like if they order a 3D, they can just click on Amazon, order a 3D printer and go download the software they need in one, you know, from one spot. So. Absolutely. All right. Very good. So I guess the last uh, bullet point here in the file, in the uh, CAD software section is file types. Uh, what do you mean uh, there? Okay. So with file types, uh, it's worth noting, like whenever you, when, like, I don't, I don't know about you guys. Whenever I post like a video of me doing something, everybody that shows up in the comments, specifically on Reddit, and they go, like, can I get an STL? Can I get an STL? Can I get an STL? And I make fun of them because if you're going to get into this stuff, please, for the love of God and Jesus and all the other powerful deities and everything that is holy, do not just share STLs. I'll explain why by explaining to you the difference in file types. So again, there's like a, there's like a triple hierarchy of file types. The best possible one is a native file. So what a native file is, is Inventor has its own file type, .ipt. Fusion 360 has its own file type. I think it's F3D. SolidWorks has its own file type. It's like SLDPRT. So every, each one of these CAD studios has their own uh, like individual file type. And that's known as like a source file, or is this source or native format. That's probably the best file that you could share with people. So what you can do with that is import so like any major CAD studio, so like NX, uh, Simons NX, uh, SolidWorks, Inventor, Fusion, they can all open one another's CAD, their native CAD files. And if you're using the same studio as the person was using, so if I'm an inventor and I send you a part and you open an inventor, you can see exactly the steps I made to make that part. And so you can edit the exact steps I made to make that part, which is a very, very powerful tool. As, you, as, as, as folks out there learn CAD, you'll begin to see, it's incredibly powerful to have the original source file for a part, incredibly powerful. So, the next step down from like the source file is known as uh, like a step file. I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to confuse people with like names and definitions and you know what, what the actual difference is here between these files. But a step file, you can think of it as a native file, but it's got no history of how that part was made. Uh, so it doesn't okay. have you tell you like that this part was made using this sort of operation and this sort of operation. It just takes that part, all of those operations, and converges them into one body and says, this is the part. However, it is still a solid part. So if I was to go and edit that part, 
Like if I, you know, if I wanted to like create, make this hole a little bit bigger, I could create a new hole and then cut out a hole on top of where that old hole was to increase the size of a hole. And so in that way, step is editable. It just doesn't have that history of how the part was made, which is an incredibly useful tool. But you can always, if you, if you have a step file, you can always, it's not a hard way to do it. It's just a little bit more tedious, but, but mm -hmm. not terribly hard. And so now we're getting to like the nitty gritty worst of the bunch, which is STL. And also included in this batch is OBJ. I personally like OBJ better just because OBJ understands what units are and STL files don't understand what units are, which is the discussion for another time. It's like a 3D gun printing 3, 102. We can talk about this. <laughs> but so, so STL files do not have a, like a history of how they were made and they're not a solid body. STL files are just like a mesh of faces. So it takes, so whenever you export a step file or a native file to an STL. Your CAD software converts that into a bunch of flat faces because STLs also don't understand what a circle is. So those of you who have taken calculus understand that you can like approximate a circle by like a very, very multi-sided polygon. It's like a 50-sided polygon looks like a circle. And when it comes to printing that part, 50 sides on a polygon, it's very difficult to tell that it's not a circle at that point. But that's essentially what your step file does is it converts anything that's round to a flat face and it converts everything that's already to a flat face to a flat face. And so that's what your step file, is. sorry, that's what your STL file is, is it's just a bunch of faces merged together. Because of that, uh, 3D, the 3D printer slicer, the slicer software can understand what STLs are because they're, they're a mesh of vertexes and faces. So it can grab those vertexes and faces easily and translate them. Meanwhile, step is a solid body, so it's still defined as like having actual circles and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's the major differences between them, and that's the reason why if you're sharing, if you're sharing CAD of you know of any type, don't, don't don't be the guy that just shares an STL, because if eventually you disappear from the movement or your computer crashes or something bad happens, you're going to lose all of that part history and all of that editability, and so you're going to force someone to one day later manually go through and pull dimensions one at a time off of that STL part and convert it back into a native format, which I've done before and it is really, really not fun. So mm. if, if at all possible, when you're sharing CAD, share all three formats because you know it takes you five minutes to convert it to each format. Just share it that way. Right. That's, that's my that's my PSA on file types. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I can imagine that be, that uh, that would be frustrating to work with. Um, and how you're, you're trying to have some sort of standard way of doing things. Um, yeah, yeah, very interesting. So I guess um, here we get to kind of some miscellaneous points um, on the outline. And uh, it's uh, basically, and I'm curious about this too, um, if I get a 3D printer and, um, uh, I don't know, uh, yeah, if I get a, if I get a 3D, 3D printer, uh, where do I get, uh, where do I buy gun parts, uh, including non-printed upper and lower parts? Like where do I get the stuff to start 3D printing? Okie dokie. So, specifically for finishing gun parts, uh, like it, like in the README for the, the Glock 17 frames, we had mentioned that Midway USA is a good site, uh, Brownells is a good site. Uh, for, specifically for Glock stuff, aepbuilder.com is a good site. Uh, generally, like, you know, fa fairly cheap prices. Brownells doesn't have cheap prices. Brownells is pretty much always like 2% more expensive than anywhere for whatever reason. That being said, Brownells pretty much always has whatever it is you're looking for in stock where other places don't. I like giving business to Brownells just because I like what Brownells does with like their retro rifles, but that's uh, totally, uh, don't, don't support Brownells just because I support Brownells, unless you also think retro ARs are super cool. But uh, there, as, as far as like, if you want to build cheap AR-15s, I'm sure most people know about Palmetto State Armory. If you don't know about Palmetto State Armory, you need to learn about Palmetto State Armory. Because the first AR that I built on a printed lower, I finished for under $300. And you're going to think, well, doesn't that mean that it's like crappy quality? And I'm not going to name other people's companies because people get offended when you make fun of their crappy quality ARs. Palmetto doesn't make crappy quality ARs. Some people think that they do. I think it's just that Palmetto lets lemons go out the door sometimes. I think overwhelmingly people getting uh, ARs from Palmetto have exceptionally great experience with it. 
you know, the people who tell you it's just as good as extra high quality, I don't know that that's the case. But I do know that Palmetto ARs are great. I've never had like a misfire. I've never had a big problem with a Palmetto AR that wasn't the fault of something that wasn't. So, so, so I've had misfires in Palmetto ARs, but they were built on a printed lower and it's the printed lower's fault. Or I've had jams with using a printed magazine when it was a printed magazine's fault. So um, generally speaking, if you're going for Glock parts, ADP builders is the way to go just because it's so much cheaper than buying factory Glock parts. If you're buying AR uppers, I think Palmetto State Army is the way to go. Uh, Anderson is also sort of cheap. Uh, Midway USA, I think their in-house AR line is called AR Stoner. And it's also fairly cheap stuff. Uh, cheap in terms of price, not cheap in terms of quality. I, I also have a couple AR Stoner ARs, and they run quite well. Mm -hmm. um, as far as buying ammo... AmmoSeek.com is the only thing that I use anymore. It just essentially compares all of the different sites out there and finds you the cheapest in terms of cents per round. Uh, it's essentially the only way I managed to afford all of the testing for the G17s because I, I never had a 9mm gun before doing the printed G17. And I, I ended up doing almost $1,000 worth of 9mm ammo. Wow, the only reason yeah. I was able to afford that was because I had found it uh, cheap on AmmoSeek. Because I had been paying like the local uh, sportsman store prices, which was expensive. It was like 25 cents a round or more that I was being scammed for. Whereas online, it's like 18 cents or less a round, which is significant savings whenever you're blowing, you know, hundreds and hundreds of rounds in a week in testing. Right, right. Um, as far as parts for stuff that isn't guns, uh, you can get 3D printer parts all over the place. Amazon or eBay is generally your best bet. Um, I buy practically all of my filament from Amazon. It sucks that you can only get uh, the DuPont stuff from a company, a distributor named Coex. And Coex charges far more for shipping than it costs them to ship, which is kind of a lame business practice. I think Matter Hackers sometimes has the normal non glass filled Zytel in stock. And Matter Hackers printing is much more reasonable than Coex. Um, I think that about covers like you know what it is that you would need to buy. You buy acetone from Walmart or whatever. You buy acetone from wherever you buy acetone from. Mm -hmm. Tell them it's for making meth and not for making guns, or else they suspect that you're making guns. <laughs> right, right. So um, this came up a couple times in uh, in the Twitter threads uh, when uh, you announced uh, this this discussion, um, where you know gun printing 101. And uh, some people are just interested in uh, common errors and troubleshooting. Uh, what are normal things that arise and what are some solutions to, to solving those? So I would say the most common error is going to be uh, your Z offset. And so what that means is the height between your bed and your nozzle, the tip of your nozzle, always has to be set manually, at least on hobby printers. On like industry printers, this is not the case. But like on Prusas, you have to set that distance manually. On Enders or Creality's, you have to set that distance manually. And until you get good at setting that distance manually, you're not going to get good prints. You're going to have prints that have like horrible quality or like they mess up badly in the middle of the print. All sorts of different issues you'll run into if your Z offset isn't right. So in general, the way you want your Z offset to work is uh, just print, print a print that's essentially just like flat, uh, a flat rectangle, but one layer high. You can you draw this print in CAD, or you can just set like an extra wide brim, or just print a nothing. So, so import a part that's like nothing into your slicer, and then say that you want to print a raft for it. And so watch as it prints that first layer. There shouldn't be any gap. So, so your first layer should go down nice and evenly. It shouldn't look like your first layer is smushed so thin that you can see the bed through it. Like it shouldn't look like an extra stretched out balloon where you can sort of see through an extra stretched out balloon. You don't want it to look like that, but you also don't want it to be like the, you know, the it's so not smushed down that it just looks like it's a bunch of lines that aren't touching each other. And so if you've got a printer, you'll be able to like understand better what I'm saying here. But if your nozzle is too far away from your bed, your plastic won't be smushed down to form a layer. It'll just be like layers, like, like if you can imagine just take spaghetti noodles and make it into like loose rectangles where the like the plastic the, the noodles don't touch each other, that would be a problem. 
meanwhile, if it, like so, if you can imagine you you took that you know, those that arrangement of noodles and smashed it with an anvil, if your nozzle is too close to your bed, it'll do that. So it, it squishes the noodle so far out that it's not going to form a layer that way. Mm-hmm. So the ideal is it sort of creates like an oval shaped blob as it goes as it goes and prints on uh, uh, like one you know, so one line that it's printing is it should so, sort of be about twice as wide as it is high, at least on your first layer. And as it's printing, so if it's printing a rectangle, it should be a continuous rectangle. There shouldn't be any air gaps and it shouldn't be so thin that it looks like you're looking through a stretched out balloon. It should be, it should have some height to it, but it should also, like each line that's next to each other should touch. There shouldn't be any air gaps. If it isn't like that, then you probably, something's wrong with your Z offset. Uh, for, for your uh, podcast notes, I have some pictures that Prusa put out that's like helpful pictures for setting your Z offset. Perfect. Those yep. would be super helpful. Because I'm sure as I'm describing these things here, people who don't have those pictures will go, what the hell is he talking about? Meanwhile, I'm just picturing these pictures in my head saying, how do I describe this? Right. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll load up the show notes with uh, with lots of goodies. So, yeah, just go to vonnypodcast.com forward slash 55 if you are not listening on the podcast page. So um, the next section here is uh, just a section you titled Food for Thought. Um, you want to kind of cover those? Yeah, so th- this is the – whenever I was talking way earlier, I said we get to it later. Well, it's later. So what I want to talk about here is uh, so like some, some more theoretical stuff. So we have to like sit down and – take out our tobacco pipes and wear our old school golf caps or whatever, because we're going to have a very gentlemanly conversation or gentle womanly conversation, <laughs> gentle person, gentle personly conversation. So uh, I, I propose that 3D printers in relation to making guns aren't ever going to be the answer, at least not until metal printing comes along. And even when metal printing is here, I don't think that you're going to see 3D printing ever replace traditional means of manufacture. I think that 3D printing is an answer to lots of the questions that are out there. So specifically, how do you make complex geometry? Like making an AR lower in traditional manufacturing methods is very difficult. I know there's the guy who casted an AR lower out of soda cans. Everyone loves to link me that video. Keep in mind that that guy also has incredible knowledge of machine. He's a machinist. Without a doubt, he's a machinist. The guy may claim to not be a machinist somewhere in the video. I don't give a crap. That dude's a machinist. He's smarter than a lot of the machinists I know. Dude is really, really sharp making a lower out of cast soda cans. You can't, you can't really easily make an AR lower on a mill. Not, not, that, not that easily. Meanwhile, you can be essentially an idiot and 3D print one. Assuming you know how to run a 3D printer, you can 3D print your own lower. You can, you can be an idiot as far as uh, traditional manufacturing means, I should say. So what I'm trying to get at here is 3D printing, as I have it written here, 3D printing is a answer, but it is not the answer. So 3D printing answers a lot of the questions. So some of these questions are, how do you rifle a barrel? I think 3D printing offers you the answer there. And you know, How do you make complex geometry? Guarantee guarantee to you 3D printing is the answer there. How do you make ergonomic parts easily? 3D printing, duh, is the answer there. So to touch on that rifling part, and I, th- I think in our next podcast, we should touch on this as far as like the, you know, the up and coming projects. You can use 3D printing's ability to print complex geometries as an ability to make advanced tooling. So you can make very specific tool shapes using 3D printing, then use those tools to improve in like traditional means of manufacture. So you can improve traditional means of manufacturing using 3D printing. So in, in the in the industry, this is known as like assisted, additive assisted technology. So like 3D printing is true, like uh, is professionally known as additive manufacturing because it has to have a cool name. So additive manufacturing assisted technology. So I recommend everyone who's listening to this to go check out the, the veg oil guy on YouTube. He's a British guy who does like uh, casting, but a lot of the casting he does, like metal casting stuff, but a lot of the metal casting he does, he uses a cheap 3D printer to make the investments for it. And if you don't know what an investment is, it's essentially the part that you want to cast. He 3D prints out of plastic. Then he uses that plastic part to make a mold. He melts the plastic out of the mold. Then he pours aluminum or copper or brass or whatever into the mold. 
So your end result has been a metal cast part in the shape of what that printed part used to be. And in the industry, that's known as additive assisted casting, mm. AAC, which is like a really big up and coming thing. I believe BMW is making entire engine blocks this way now where they're using a 3D printer that prints in, I think it's in sand. And so they, they print they print this in like bonded sand and then they use water to wash the sand out after they cast this sand in a mold. And then they wash the bonded sand out and then you're left with an investment of an engine block. And so then you pour your metal in there and now you've, you know, now you've cast an engine block and your tooling was no, nothing. It was, your tooling was sand. Sand costs nothing. Wow. Running a 3D printer costs next to nothing. So That's huge interesting. advancements that are being made in the industry there, as well as I mean I, I believe some I believe by now people have uh, lost metal cast AR lowers. But if you wanted aluminum AR lowers, not to knock on the guy that made the soda can lowers, but here's the way to do it: bust out your ender, open our cat the the cat assembly we have for the you know, the accurate AR lower, print that AR lower even though it wouldn't work as a printed lower, lost PLA cast using Veg Oil Guy's technique and his setup. And now you've got an aluminum AR lower and your tooling was what? A 3D printer and a cheap metal forge. Mm -hmm. So it becomes abusable in that way. That's one way that 3D printing technology is abusable, is additive assisted casting. Another way that it's abusable is, uh, so, so what me and Jeff Rod had sort of demonstrated on the rifling of barrels. So you can do what's known as I guess additive assisted electrochemical machining. We need to come up with a better acronym. But using this additive assisted electrochemical machining, you can use the fact that 3D printers can make a complex geometry such as rifling grooves, and you can use that to then rifle barrels very easily using electrochemical machining. Because traditionally, electrochemical machining, like the like the one caveat to it is, your tooling has to be as at least as complex as the part you want to make because it can only cut away from this you know the shape that your tool makes is the shape that it's going to cut so your tool ends up having to be as complex or more complex than the part itself you're trying to make but you using 3d printer it's not hard to make complex shapes especially whenever there's no heat and there's no uh, for and no like wear forces involved and in electrochemical machining there's no heat and there's no wear forces so it becomes like a perfect complement so like one big question that had always been in there surrounding electrochemical machining, well, here's your answer in the form of uh, additive assisted technology. So that's sort of where I leave my like scripted part of this is don't think of 3D printing as we're going to 3D print entire guns. Think of 3D printing as it's going to make making a gun incredibly easy without having to print it. Very good and, and, and well said. I think uh, Cody's response uh, in my interview with him was uh, was was similar, kind of uh, the uh, you know the additive assist technology portion of it. So, um, all right, very good. Uh, so now on to some listener questions. Uh, we're doing a lot better on time, man. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely, we're doing a, a whole hell of a lot I've been better. Glancing, on time. glancing over at the time as we're going. Yes, it's it's it's. Uh, the, I, the, I'm sure there are some listeners that'll be thankful for that. Um, but uh, anyway, anyway, uh, so uh, uh, a really good a really good question here, and, and I guess you might have alluded to it a little bit here. Uh, but uh, what can we do with a four hundred dollar printer that can't be done on a two hundred dollar printer? So, I'll, I'll reiterate this just because I think well, this is just my way of thinking. Anyone else there is free to think differently because this is not something that I would like. Some things that I think I put my foot down on thinking mostly because I think I have an informed opinion there, but I'm not putting my foot down on this because you all are free to spend your money the way you want. But I would only ever buy something that's full feature like a Prusa or something that's bare minimum like an Ender. So like there are more expensive Creality printers, like there's an Ender 5, and I think the Ender 5 is right around $400. And I forget what exactly the Ender 5 offers, but it's not worth $200 to me. It might be automatic bed leveling. But I wouldn't pay two hundred dollars for automatic bed leveling alone. It's it's you know it's, it's something where as soon as you learn how to bed level, it's not even a problem anymore. Especially mm -hmm. because as long as you don't move your printer around ever, if it just sits on the same table, you won't ever have to re-level your bed. Maybe save for like once every several hundred hours of printing. Gotcha. So so what's the difference? I mean, without knowing like a specific four hundred dollar printer and a specific two hundred dollar printer, I can't really tell you the difference. But in general. You're going to get more of those features like uh, like a, a surface for your printed bed, 
eventually you'll get into the price range where it's not a direct Teflon on heater block uh, hot end. Eventually you'll get up into like full metal hot ends where there isn't a Teflon tube in it at all. Uh, you'll run into printers where it's got automatic bed leveling, and run into printers where it's got quick detach beds, those sort of things, or, or more print logging mm -hmm. as you increase in price. Gotcha. So, so uh, more features basically. Uh, that's uh, that makes sense. But then again, four hundred dollars, um, like uh, to get to get a couple of those other nice features. That's still not a bad price for a three D printer. Um, still, still probably, still probably a little much for someone who's, you know, like may just be considering considering it for like a hobby. But um, yeah, four hundred dollars is not bad at all. Um, so uh, you might have also alluded to this question above or explained this question above. But uh, when and why do you print with PETG instead of PLA plus? Uh, I never print with PETG, <laughs> and the reason why is because I can't print with PETG to save myself. Um, but if we're to incorporate this question of like, when do you not print with PLA? So anytime where your use case is going to be uh, getting very hot. So PLA's biggest drawback, unfortunately, is it can't handle hot operating environments. So like if you left PLA in a hot car in direct sunlight, it would start to melt, like, you know, deform completely. If you left PLA in a hot car, it would become soft. So if there's any force outside acting on it, it'll deform. But like in direct sunlight, it'll melt into like a puddle. Mm -hmm. um, so in any case where your, your, your load case, or your use case is, it's gonna be hot. Anytime where your load case requires that there's going to be uh, fatigue forces on it, don't use PLA for the reasons that I uh, over elaborated on before. PLA isn't really good at reciprocal loading. So it doesn't like to load and unload and load and unload and load and unload. That's eventually how you break PLA parts, just because of their, because of its crystalline structure. So anytime where you need flexibility, anytime where you need it to be able to stand up to the heat, don't use PLA. That said, I mean, people tend to like misunderstand when it is that you need heat resistance and when it is that you don't. The Glock frames that I've printed have been in PLA. I printed a couple in the, the the high strength glass filled nylon. But most of the ones, like the one I use, is in PLA. Mm -hmm. uh, you can dump a mag and then reload, then dump a mag, and it still won't be hot enough to even make the PLA start to become soft. So, under normal use of a firearm, PLA isn't going to be getting too hot. It's like whenever you're in a hot environment, then you start dumping mags. Like if you're 110 degrees in the desert and then you start dumping mags, yeah, you're probably going to get to that threshold. Especially if you take a drum mag and dump it, I guarantee you then you'll get it hot enough that your frame will start to warp in your hands. But under normal operating conditions, I wouldn't imagine it would be a problem. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, no hot environments, no uh, loading and unloading like on an AR buffer tower. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. So uh, someone else asked a question on Twitter. Basically, uh, you know, it's great hearing, you know, like how to's and, you know, what to do. Um, but what about uh, what not to do uh, when uh, when 3D printing uh, gun parts or uh, guns? Let's see what not to do. Don't tell the ATF about the auto sears. Uh, don't tell the ATF about the short barreled rifles. Don't tell the ATF about the suppressor baffles. Other than that, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I have printed none of those things for reference, nor do I have any intent to, Mr. ATF agent, but I'm sure is listening to this, and Mr. NSA agent that I'm sure is recording this conversation as it's going on live. Oh, of course. <laughs> but, <laughs> but as far as what not to do, um, apparently, evidently, don't sniff the ABS fumes. It's probably too late for me, but you, you guys don't do that. <laughs> um, uh, what not to do? So I'm going to use double negative here. What not to do is not read the README. Always read the README. The README in all caps, it's a text file that can open in any native format. You can even read it in your web browser. The reason that I spend hours and hours typing up a readme, and that Deuces from Foscat spends hours and hours formatting and like a, a spell checking, and like error checking my readmes, is because we intend for you to read them, <laughs> which a lot of people don't like to pick up on. And at really? first I was like, yeah, okay, some people don't do it, but I, I swear I get at least an email a day for the past several months, like people asking me, uh, so, what should I print the Glock frame in? Are you f stupid? <laughs> it says it says in this great big readme that we have like a professional letterhead and everything on. Right. It says print it in PLA or Zytel or whatever the hell else. I don't care. Just print it. I don't care. 
but like like the stupid questions that the read me answers and these people don't bother to read the read me and so some of these people i just respond with read me in all caps too but I, <laughs> at first i was like trying to i at first i did explain it to people nicely but eventually it just became like read me in all caps is the response they get but i have not yet not responded to anyone because i do like to respond to people it's just that i'm going to be snippy when i do it because if you can't read then i'm not going to be very polite <laughs> Sorry, people offended. Learn to read, I guess. Right, right. Um, very good. Uh, any other what not to do's? Uh, like, is there anything? Um, I don't know. I've never three D printed anything before. So, is there is there something that someone might be inclined to do that would be a dangerous thing to do? Are there any kind of like obvious things that you wouldn't think you'd have to tell somebody? Um, those are still worth mentioning. Don't bypass any software safeties on your machine. They're there for a reason. If you upgrade your hot end, of course, that's an exception because then you can increase like the max temperature to 300 Celsius. But otherwise, like there's restrictions in your machine and place on your machine for a reason. And that reason is so you don't burn your house down unless you're looking to scam your insurance company, in which case <laughs> take those restrictions off, but don't tell anyone you did it. Um, uh, like when it comes to assembling guns, uh, I've, Oh, so so here, this this one's going to come in three parts. When it comes to assembling guns, when it comes to letting spray paint dry, and when it comes to letting fiberglass resin set up, <laughs> don't rush it. And I, you know, I, I say this full well knowing that I never obey this rule. Like the the whole the whole time spray paint's drying, I try to touch it so I leave fingerprints in it. The whole time fiberglass resin is setting up, I touch it so I leave fingerprints in it. Like the whole time I'm assembling guns, I always just like want to rush through it and try and find the quickest way to do it. So I just like go nuts with a Dremel tool and you know, sand more, you know, take more off than I should have. So instead of going slow and measuring, you know, cut, cut a little bit, measure a little bit, I want to cut a lot and then measure it and go shit afterwards. <laughs> so in general, like go slow. I, I say this knowing that I will never obey such a thing. But go slow and take your time, and it's not dry yet. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Very good, very good. So I guess the the, the last thing that came up in the Twitter, um, the last thing. Um, so I, I mentioned this to Ivan in pre-show, but um, there are some other really good questions on there, but they were more like, uh, I don't know, gun printing. Uh, we might be in the 300 courses by that point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so those didn't, didn't make it into this one. Um, I, I pulled, uh, I thought, the, the best one, mo the best, most relevant ones. Um, and also, I didn't want to do another three-hour podcast. Not that I didn't, not that I didn't want to do it. I don't mind. You know, if, if the demand was there and you guys demanded a three-hour podcast, I'd probably comply. But, um, but yeah, just yeah, try to avoid that this time. Um, but the last thing that, that came up was uh, someone mentioned uh, there should be a fast-track system to onboard newbies. Uh, said that's essential. Um, so um, kind of, kind of, kind of to my comment earlier, um, I, I think we should make the show notes of this episode just. Uh, um, you know, a one-stop shop, and obviously it can be, uh, you know, distributed elsewhere. But um, I think we should just, uh, you know, make, make these, uh, make the show notes uh, very long and uh, detailed, and and uh, all that, all that good stuff. Absolutely, I concur with that. And that was like my main hope in doing this was a lot of these like 101 level questions we could have the answers to all in one place. The podcast is probably going to be like an hour and a half, more than an hour, or right closer to an hour and a half than an hour. Mm -hmm. But that's fine. Right. We still kept it like watchably short. Like like in one class, you could like not pay attention to the class and you could pay attention to me instead. This is a much more cool class than whatever <laughs> class you're in, I assure you. Yep. But but in general, like it is relatively short and we can we can put all of the links, you know, the relevant links to the things I've talked about here in the description and then I go from there really. There's your one oh one. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's valuable. I mean, uh, I'm sure you spent a lot of time answering these questions over and over again. And uh, it's not to say that you not 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 to say that you don't mind doing it. People are interested in wanting to get involved, but um, you know, it does make it easier. It saves you time, so you can you know get instead of spending that time uh, you know doing the same thing over and over again, you can uh, you know go out and make some make some uh, more uh, cool gun parts. Um, so you can just uh, hey, drop a link. Here's a, here's a podcast. You can listen to it. If not, there's show notes there that'll um, that'll uh, you know give you the information you need. Uh, so it'll uh, it'll save you time as well. And uh, you know we need we need uh, we need good folks like I've been working uh, behind the scenes on making this <laughs> stuff work. So uh, <laughs> so yes, very good. And also I, I guess I, I guess an, an idea is 
Um, if there are any other questions that, that you guys didn't get answered, um, I'm down to do another episode. I'm sure Ivan is. Uh, we could just do a QA and a episode um, if, it did, uh, if, if, if there were enough questions and there was uh, enough demand for, uh, for such a thing. Absolutely. And I'm thinking, I, I, uh, J. Star Jacob, the guy who worked with me on the AR-15 mm -hmm. CAD files, said that he would like to do uh so so what's next for deterrence dispense to talk about the fgc9 and talk about like the the up and up so you know we got like up to just after post menendez in our previous podcast like the stuff that's going on now even i'm amazed like before i thought things were cool now we're really getting into like, this is like really cool as well as like it'll bring a lot of heat from the people who don't like guns is <laughs> i mean we're we're, near, we're we're, we're you know about midway into now uh, a gun that is going to be completely like, you know like PA Ludi's gun, but it's something that we've designed and we've thought through. It's, it's super cool to me. It's just amazing. It's like like a crowdsourced, not necessarily crowdsourced, but like a, you know, independent of any government authority, independent of any like real manufacturing firm. We've designed a gun. Right. Right. Yeah, it is. Uh, um, for, from what I know, the work you guys are doing is incredible. And uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll say first off, as far as uh, one, uh, I guess, uh, one test uh, for this episode, uh, um, as far as since I don't know much about this, um, I learned a lot. Um, um, <clears throat> yeah, I learned a lot. And I mean, I feel like I could order, order a 3D printer, um, you know, get the software and I feel like I could conceivably do this. Um, whereas before I kind of, I didn't, I didn't really have any idea where to start, but it doesn't seem like it's that complex. It's like with, with most things, um, whether it's off grid homesteading, whether it's Bitcoin, what, whatever it is. Um, basically if, uh, you know, you, you kind of, uh, uh, have that, uh, that interest to learn, um, you know, this sort of self-directed, the self-directed stuff can be, can be, uh, um, learned not, not super easily, but, uh, it can be, it can be, uh, attained at a base level. So. Um, at the base level, where you can actually start, you know, three D printing mags and stuff. So that's 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 pretty cool. So, um, all right. Uh, so I guess um, what? Uh, so uh, before I let you go, why don't, why don't you go ahead and uh, plug away? So um, in the last, and I can I'll just uh, copy the show notes from the last one. There's uh, your turns to turns to Spence Twitter, um, which I'll link in there. Um, your Bitbacker for folks to. Uh, you know, send you money and suggestions, uh, send you, you know, Bitcoin or, or some, uh, some uh, altcoin um, <clears throat> with a suggestion on what to work on. They might do it um, if they can. Um, but anyway, the, I, I know they would uh, certainly appreciate your support. Um, Deterrence Dispense uh, Keybase, uh, the Deterrence Dispense Gun Streamer for, you know, all the files and such. And then I will uh, link our last discussion, uh, TVP episode number 54, uh, where we're going over, more over his uh, case. Not, not so much. Uh, although we, we did go plenty into nuts and bolts, but um, <laughs> we went uh, a lot more into uh, his story and such as well. So um, I will put all those links in the show notes, including... Um, you know the uh, the very detailed, comprehensive uh, beginner's guide to uh, to gun printing um, that will be uh, down there in the show notes as well. Vonniepodcast.com forward slash fifty five. So um, I guess uh, Ivan, before I let you go, do you have any other closing thoughts for the listeners or uh, anything that you uh, forgot to mention that you should have or uh, anything like that? Well, let's see. Um, somebody had asked me to plug something, and I said that I would plug something, and I'm completely blanking on it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it might have been the key base. I'm pretty sure that's what it was, was the key base, because I don't think that I explicitly mentioned that last time. But for, for anyone who's not aware, uh, like after Twitter deplatformed one of Amura's uh, Twitters and took down uh, in Carbonite, and, and, and Twitter has admitted they've taken these people down now for like uh, illegal activities. So Twitter has let... Uh, Twitter has let New Jersey become the arbitrator of what isn't isn't legal on the internet, <laughs> evidently. Right. So as a result of that, uh, a couple guys created a key base, and essentially we've got like all of the people who are like proponents of this stuff. It's like the like the big the big proponents from the Defense Distributed subreddit, the big proponents from Printed Gun Twitter, the big proponents from Foscad's Internet Relay Chat. We've sort of got them like into one place. And so it's super cool to see the people who like didn't interact before get to interact with each other. It's super neat to see, but it's also super cool to see. But there's like another layer of cooperation you can see, like people who are like right on the cusp of they wanted to help out, but they weren't sure the best way to do it. Whenever you're in, and Keybase is like an end-to-end -end encrypted like network, so it's like Discord, but like more, more much more privacy-centric than Discord. I guess is a good mm -hmm. way to describe it. 
So once you see these people like start to work with each other, it's it's a super cool thing, and it's kind of heartwarming to see like uh, your defense distributed and uh, uh, DefCAD might not be what they want to be, but one way or the other, that conversation hasn't stopped. And if anything, I I, I mean. I wasn't around in the early days of the conversation, so I can't say that's with certainty, but I feel like it's stronger now than it was a year ago without a doubt. Mm -hmm. And so that would lead me to lead me to suspect it's stronger now maybe than it's ever been. I can't speak with authority on that, but it's much stronger now than whenever I, you know, first joined up. Got lots of people collaborating and even if what you what you want to do is join the key base, there's like a shit posting channel. If you just want to post shitty memes, please do. Just because it's not nice to have like-minded people in the same place, you know. Because right. maybe you sit there and you lurk in general chat, and then one day you see, you know, somebody's like a Fre Freeman. Don't ask. Still hasn't stopped. We we're still doing polymer pistol frame. I'm not sure if I can announce the polymer pistol frame that we're working on next, but it's like the polymer pistol frame. It's, <laughs> it's not like a big secret what it is that we're working on. It's just that I, no, no one else has announced it yet, so I don't know if I'm going to be the first to announce it or not, but we're working on another polymer pistol frame. But Freeman Don't Ask is constantly asking, like, if you're a person listening to this that has lots of lots of polymer pistol frames, join the key base and buy a pair of digital calipers just so you can measure stuff for that guy because he will make your frame 3D printable if you're willing to feed him dimensions. Mm -hmm. I know he was working on a 5.7 for a while there, but... Essentially what he does is he gets on these websites like everygunpart.com, which I should have mentioned earlier, like where it is that you buy gun parts from. Gun broker auctions and uh, everygunpart.com. So like the police departments destroy the receivers but then sell the gun parts as a kit to these companies and then these companies go and resell them. Like every gun part, you can obtain like, like parts kits for a 5.7. So essentially, uh, every Freeman Don't Ask will just like browse every, every gun part until he finds a polymer pistol frame parts kit that's cheap. He'll buy that parts kit and then he'll cat up the frame for it and make it 3D printable. And that's why we've got such oddities as like the DB380 and that's how we've got such oddities. Well, I, I don't want to call the shield an oddity but I don't think you can buy shield part kit parts kits just on their own. Mm -hmm. but, you know, There's enough, enough people using them in drive-bys or whatever that the costs have collected enough <laughs> Jesus that they're Christ. selling them to these reselling companies. <laughs> right, right. <clears throat> that's interesting it's uh, certainly interesting so um yeah i will put links to those links to uh to uh, all of those places uh, in the show notes definitely go check them out um so was uh, was there anything else man i think that just about gets it all right very good very good so uh all right thanks again ivan uh, that was uh, certainly a lot of fun um so as he said uh, multiple times uh, we will jam pack the show notes with lots of goodies uh, if you're looking to get involved uh, please share this episode around. Let us know what you think. And subscribe to the podcast feed if you haven't already. Just search for the Vonnie Podcast on your favorite podcatcher. And uh, we are now on Spotify, too. Uh, make sure to check out the, uh, check out Libertarian Tech Publications for tools to aid you in your self-liberation. Uh, or if you're an author looking for a liberty-focused uh, publisher, uh, that is libertarianattack.com. Uh, so thanks for tuning in. Uh, until next time, let's build the Agora, and let's build Second Realms.